welcome, Rob. Can you start us out by providing us with a definition of hematuria? Sure. Hematuria is red blood cells in the urine. And typically, we're going to see two ways that this will come into our office. The first is when the patient themselves notices blood in the urine. That's gross hematuria. The other way is if we've sent a urinalysis for some other purpose and it comes back with red cells in it, but that you can't see in the urine. That's microscopic hematuria. Does uh, red urine always suggest the presence of red blood cells? Well, that's the trick. Not all red urine is due to red blood cells. You can get red or reddish brown discoloration from a number of things. One is if there's hemoglobin or myoglobin in the urine from red cell breakdown and hemolytic anemia or myoglobin appearing from rhabdomyolysis. Some of the porphyrias will turn the urine reddish brown. There's some foods that'll do it. I don't know if you've ever noticed after you eat beets, sometimes there's a little bit of a red tinge, red food coloring. And finally, there's some drugs that'll do it. The most common is phenazepyridine, a bladder anesthetic. But some others, uh, cascara, diphenylhydantoin, methyl dopa, phenolthaline laxatives, those will all turn your urine red. So how did the red blood cells actually get into the urine? They can get into the urine pretty much from anywhere in the urinary tract, starting with the glomeruli. They can leak through there. They can get in through the collecting system from the ureters, the bladder, and of course in men, the prostate, and finally the urethra. Anywhere along there, the red cells can enter. Rob, do we know what causes most cases of hematuria? Well, if we take all hematuria, lump it together, and look, the bulk of the cases are going to involve microscopic hematuria and idiopathic causes, which means we don't really know. But there are a number of more specific causes which we ought to mention. The most common and the ones we really want to keep in mind are urinary tract infection, prostatitis, and urinary calculi. That's, of course, mainly in adults. Now, we do want to be thinking of cancer and prostate disease, but that's typically in patients over 50, although younger patients with risk factors may develop cancer. Now, Rob, I'm trained as a pediatrician, so as you've already alluded to, the urinary calculi are mainly found in adults. Is this discussion primarily focused on adults versus children? Well, primarily on adults, but some of the causes appear at all ages and that they're worth mentioning. Certainly in children, we want to think about glomerular diseases. You probably see cases of that with a fair frequency. And these can be primary renal disorders that can be hereditary or acquired, or they can be secondary to a number of causes. And the main one that we'd like to remember is the following group A beta hemolytic strep infection. Other causes are connective tissue disorders like lupus, uh, Henoch Schoenlein purpura, certainly things that you'd see in the pediatric group. And some other causes that everyone might have, polycystic kidney disease, sickle cell anemia, and of course trauma, any blunt or penetrating flank injury can cause hematuria, although we're not really going to discuss traumatic hematuria today. And finally, one cause that we may not see here, but if you're traveling overseas, you might, schistosoma hematobium infection. That's a parasitic fluke that lives in Africa and some places in India and parts of the Middle East that loves to invade the urinary tract, get in the walls of the bladder and lay eggs, causing irritation and, of course, a lot of hematuria. In the United States, we will only think of that in people who've traveled to endemic areas. So how common is schistosomiasis? Well, it's very common in those areas. It's probably the commonest cause of hematuria there, but in the United States, it's a bit rare. Our book provides a pretty comprehensive approach to the history and physical, but for our listeners, can you give us just some of the highlights of how we should start evaluating the patient? Well, as always, we'll start with our history and then progress to the physical. In the history, a couple things are important. In the history of present illness, we'd like to discover if there are any urinary obstructive symptoms versus urinary irritative symptoms. Now, the difference obstructive symptoms, just like you might think, are trouble passing urine. Uh, difficulty starting, difficulty stopping the stream, incomplete emptying, getting up at night. Those are obstructive symptoms. Then irritative symptoms are burning with urination, running really often to the urine, that's urinary frequency, or a sense of urgency. The review of systems, it's wise to check for a few things that might point us along the way, and that would be patients with joint pain or rashes, something that might suggest a connective tissue disorder. In the past medical history, we'd certainly want to ask about 
known conditions that we already mentioned that might cause hematuria, but in particular, the patient might not volunteer that they had a sore throat several weeks before, which might indicate that they had a group A beta hemolytic strep infection at that time, and now they're presenting with glomerular nephritis. Other conditions, you know, certainly ask if they've had kidney stones before, or perhaps endocarditis. Again, they may not mention that, but endocarditis can predispose to hematuria. Is family history significant? Sure. We should try to identify relatives with known causes, particularly polycystic kidney disease, glomerular diseases, and GU cancer. What sort of things on physical exam should we be looking for? Well, the physical exam can guide us a little bit. It's not going to be too specific, but we should look for signs of hypertension and edema. Both of those can come along with glomerular nephritis. When you're listening to the heart, be sure to try to detect any murmurs that would suggest endocarditis. In uh, men, a digital rectal exam should be done. You want to examine the prostate for enlargement, nodules, and tenderness. And of course, in females, we want to do a pelvic exam. It's one of the things we don't want to do is confuse vaginal bleeding with urinary bleeding, which of course can be hard for female patients to tell. So you do a pelvic exam, and if there's any sign of vaginal blood, then you'll work that up. What are some of the red flags that our listeners should know about um, that would point to conditions that should be more urgently dealt with? Well, there's a couple things that if you see, you should jump on right away. Certainly gross hematuria. If somebody comes in and they're passing gross blood, that should be worked up fairly soon. Uh, persistent microscopic hematuria in older patients, and that's more than six months, that needs to be worked up at the time. Pretty much anyone over 50 with new onset of hematuria should be looked at. And finally, the combination we mentioned of hypertension and edema suggesting glomerular nephritis that can progress fairly quickly and we want to make that diagnosis soon. So we've, we've heard about a lot of different information. How do we start interpreting this information from history and physical? Well, we can synthesize a few good facts from this, although, frankly, although we like to avoid testing whenever it's not really necessary, and most of the time we're going to have to get some tests in hematuria. But we can make a few generalizations. One is uh, with the glomerular disease that we mentioned, uh, we're looking for edema and hypertension. But if we find blood clots in the urine, that pretty much rules out glomerular disease. We mentioned kidney stones presenting with hematuria, and they certainly will, but they usually almost always have excruciating colicky flank pain. If you've ever seen one of them, it's pretty much unforgettable. You won't mistake that. They're writhing. They're often vomiting. Less severe pain, you don't want to think so much of kidney stones as something like cancer, infection, or even polycystic kidney disease can have chronic flank pain. Then there's the urinary irritative symptoms we mentioned. If a patient has those, then we want to really think bladder infection in men, prostate infection. Those are by far the commonest causes. But don't forget, certain cancers, particularly bladder and prostate, can cause some irritative symptoms too. So certainly in the at-risk patient group, think about those. Urinary obstructive symptoms, you're pretty much thinking prostate disease then. If you should chance to find an abdominal mass, then that would be something like polycystic kid kidney disease or renal cell carcinoma. And as we mentioned before, finally, if they've traveled to Africa or parts of the Middle East, then we want to think about schistosomiasis. What kind of testing should we get? Well, before we start into any massive testing program, we want to make sure that we really have hematuria and not red urine. So the key test here is a urinalysis. In women, if there's any vaginal bleed, including menstrual period, you want to get the specimen with a straight catheterization. Now, that may sound invasive, but it's certainly not as invasive and expensive as putting some woman through a whole battery of uh, genitourinary tests when they really have a gynecologic problem. So we want to get the straight catheter specimen. And uh, assuming we have red cells in the urine, then the key thing is to look at some other features of the urinalysis. And the big thing, we're looking for casts, protein, and dysmorphic red cells. And dysmorphic is just a fancy word for funny-looking red cells, cells with spicules, they're folded, they have blebs. Those kinds of cells and the casts and the protein really suggest glomerular disease. On the other hand, if we find white cells or bacteria, then we're thinking an infectious etiology. If there's anything like that, then we want to send a urine culture. 
because some patients with cystitis in particular may just have red cells in the urine as far as we can see. So we'll send a culture, and of course, if that's positive, we've got a diagnosis there. So other tests that we'd like, presuming we found the hematuria, the other testing is divided up based on patient age and whether it's microscopic or gross hematuria. Starting with patients under 50, including children, if there's only microscopic hematuria and no urine findings suggesting glomerular disease and no clinical clues that they've got a particular disorder and no risk factors of cancer, I know that's a lot of things, but that will still be the bulk of your young hematuria patients. Those folks can be observed. No further testing, just get another urinalysis in about six months. If the hematuria is persistent then, that's when we'll get some imaging studies, either ultrasonography or a contrast CT. Now, if they're under 50 and they have gross hematuria, we should get some imaging studies at that point. We're not going to wait, so we'll either get an ultrasound or CT of the abdomen and pelvis. If the urine suggests glomerular disease, then we'll want to get some more blood tests and look at their renal function with a measure of BUN, serum creatinine, electrolytes. The workup of glomerular nephritis, of course, we're not going to cover here, but that may involve serologic tests, kidney biopsies, or both. So what about our patients that are over 50? Ah, uh, yes, age group close to my heart. Everybody over 50 really needs a cystoscopy. We've got to rule out cancer there. And they also should have the other imaging studies if the cystoscopy is negative, so either ultrasound or CT. Also get the cystoscopy on people who are under 50 but have risk factors for cancer. With men over 50, we should check the prostate-specific antigen, the PSA, if that's elevated, then they should have a further workup for prostate cancer. Rob, do we have any advice about treatment? The treatment's directed at the actual cause. You have to make a diagnosis, and then we'll treat that. There's no specific treatment just for the hematuria itself. What key points can we provide our listeners that they can walk away with that really summarizes everything we've talked about? A couple of takeaways we'd like to remember. One, Red urine should be differentiated from hematuria, which, of course, is red blood cells in the urine. Two, the urinalysis and urine sediment exam helps differentiate glomerular from non-glomerular causes. Three, the risk of serious disease increases with aging and with duration and degree of hematuria. And finally, four, cystoscopy and imaging tests are usually needed only for patients over 50 years old or for younger patients with gross hematuria or risk factors for cancer. Well, thanks, Rob, for joining us today, and thank you all for listening to this topic from the Merck Manual of Patient Symptoms. And remember what Dr. Francis Peabody said over 80 years ago, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient.